Welcome to this presentation of The Way It Was, Looking Back 100 Years with Vintage Postcards by Barry Emery. I gave this talk originally in 1914 at Bashwater Grill, but it was not recorded. So I'm repeating it here and recording it to put on YouTube. Let's begin by looking at a little history of the postcard itself. The post office sold this card in 1893, and it was the first official postcard that they sold and could go through the mails. Other postcards were sold as souvenirs, but this one was an official one by the post office showing the exposition in Chicago in 1893. Now, originally, you could not write on the address side of the postcard. The only thing you could put there was the address itself. This one, by the way, was mailed in 1905. It was going to somebody in Savoy. It was mailed in Adams, but they forgot to put a stamp on or the stamp got knocked off. But for whatever reason, it was held for postage. <clears throat> well, the law changed in 1907 and it allowed you to write a note on the address side of a postcard. And so here we have an example from 1909 where the postcard is split. So the note goes on the left and the address on the right, the way we do it today. Now I used to have this car, <clears throat> but I knew based on the trip that I was about to take, it would never make it over the steep grades of the Mohawk Trail and in other adventures in Berkshire County. So I went shopping for a new car and this is what I found. It's a beautiful model and has a very powerful engine. And this is what we're going to use for our journey this Sunday. By the way, the car was made in Berkshire County by the Berkshire Automobile Company in Pittsfield. It has a 35 horsepower motor and it cost me $3,000. They made about 40 of these cars that year. Here's a look at our route. We're gonna start in Charlemont. We're gonna go up this newly opened scenic road called the Mohawk Trail. And we're going to go down through North Adams and into Adams. And we're gonna take a side journey to the top of Mount Greylock on another new road that's just opened recently. Then we'll go into Cheshire, down through Pittsfield and on to Lenox. This postcard shows the Mohawk Trail as it begins in Turnus Falls and heads all the way through the Berkshires and ending in Williamstown. It is basically route two the Northern Highway going across Massachusetts. This is a modern postcard, by the way, but it does show the, the route of the Mohawk Trail. So here's a photograph, not a postcard, but a photograph of the trail being constructed in 1913. It's still in pretty rough shape in this time frame, but we're going to go just before it opens and hopefully we will find a little smoother sailing than what this shows. This postcard from the era talks about the opening. Built at a cost of 368,000 and was formally opened October 27th, 1914. So a pretty expensive project for back then. And one of the first roads in our nation created for automobiles so that they could drive through the scenic areas of a state. My wife bought a new hat for the trip and I did as well. It matches my suit, but there's one other piece of equipment I need. Most of the Mohawk Trail is a dirt road. And in order to Drive it safely without getting your eyes filled with sand. I'm going to need these goggles. I think they look pretty good on me, don't you? 
Okay, let's get started. I hope this old buggy will get will will turn over. It does have a little bit of a starting issue, which I'll have to bring back to the garage later this month. Here we go. Ah, now it's going fine. So here's the first postcard of the Mohawk Trail. This shows the Cold River Bridge. This bridge was actually destroyed by Sandy, the Hurricane Sandy um, in 2012. It has since been rebuilt. One of the famous places on the Mohawk Trail is the hill leading up to Dead Man's Curve. You can look down onto the Cold River. Here we are just passing the dead man's curve. It would be down the hill just at that corner in this postcard. My car is a little faster than most of them, so I'm able to pass cars quite easily. We've gotten to Whitcomb Summit, one of the first lookouts on the trail where you can have a beautiful view looking east. And just a little ways past that, we came to the place where you can get some water. Some of these old cars need water pretty frequently, and it's the passengers as well. Here we have some sisters and their brother getting a drink. A little ways down the road, <clears throat> they stop to have lunch. And this postcard shows them enjoying a spot along the trail. I'm not sure why they're not offering any lunch to their brother, but. That's their issue. And then we get to the top of the Mohawk Trail and another beautiful view. This postcard is the Western Summit. And so we've just crossed over the highest point on the trail and now we're looking west down into North Adams and over at Mount Greylock. And they have the wigwam gift shop and a nice tower for looking at the views. And as we leave this corner, we're going to head down towards another famous spot on the trail known as the Hairpin Turn. It's a very steep grade going down the hill into North Adams. This postcard shows what it looked like just after the trail opened. There's no gift shop and no restaurant at the Hairpin Turn at this time. Notice the big ledge on the right. That's a beautiful uh, spot in the wintertime with nice ice sickles forming as the water drips over that ledge. And then we're looking up and are going around the hairpin turn. The Wigwam Gift Center is at the top of that curvy hill. So it was a very popular trail when it opened. As many as 350 cars an hour were going over that new road. And it didn't take long before someone built this gift shop at the hairpin turn, along with a viewing tower. The problem is that slope leading down to the hairpin turn is so treacherous and so steep that vehicles often lost their brakes. And it wasn't long before a truck came down there and smashed into that restaurant, destroying it. Here's what they did to prevent it happening in the future. They built the new building back behind that rock ledge. Notice the ledge on the right, and now the restaurant is tucked behind it. Okay, moving away from the hairpin turn, we enter North Adams, a postcard showing the Richmond Hotel. Notice the trolley tracks, and of course, horses and buggies are still very common at this time. This postcard is of 
Sanford Blackington's house. He was a local mill, mill owner. It took more than two years to build it and it cost $75,000. Today, it's the public library in North Adams. And this building is also an interesting building in 2014. It's the Berkshire Hill Sanatorium. It was purported that they could cure cancer. There's an advertisement an institution for the scientific treatment of cancer, tumors, and all other forms of malignant, malignant growths without the use of the knife. Well, the Medical Association of America didn't like that kind of, um, of boasting, and they brought a suit against them, and it ended up putting them out of business. It, a year or two later, it was torn down. We moved from North Adams, down into Adams, and as we come adjacent to Mount Greylock, we notice this beautiful view showing three landslides. And here's the reason. During July and August, previous to August 20th, 1901, the date on which the slides occurred, 12.92 inches of rain fell, being 5.8 inches above normal and a very heavy rain um, at three o'clock caused this landslide. Now, the landslide on the right is where they decided to run the electric lines up to the top of Greylock. And this is the same view of the mountain today, and you can still see the scar where that power line goes up on that landslide. Just barely see the tower at the top of the mountain. And just below that, you can see a rock ledge. There was another landslide there. That landslide um, revealed a ledge that some people said looked like a Indian head. So we heard that their new road had been built on Greylock, and we decided we would see if our car could make it up to the top. Rockwell Road, built in 1907. Another dirt road. Here's what it looked like and as we went through a spruce forest on our way up the hill. There were many places where they had to blast stone in order to get through a ledge. Here's the new steel tower they built on top of Greylock. This one built by the Boston Bridge Works, replaced an old wooden tower. They charged us uh, to climb up to the top 10 cents. And by the way, there was a toll to go up on Rockwell Road. That was 25 cents. In today's currency, it would be about $9. I'm glad they don't charge a toll today. It's a state reservation and it's free to drive up. This is the original Bascom Lodge at the top, at the summit of Greylock. And now we've come back down the mountain and we're heading into Adams. Adams was a very, very prosperous mill town at one time. This is the Renfrew Mills. And here's a postcard showing the housing. All along the left of this picture are the mill houses. Many of them are still there today. And Renfrew had a mansion. Uh, his mansion was known as Bonnie Bray. He lived in it from 1883 to 1901. And when he died, it became the Greylock Rest Home. Later, the church had taken it and used it for a while for housing for priests and nuns. 
And then a school bought it in 1960s, but it eventually burned down in 1977. Another famous mill in Adams was the Berkshire Cotton Mills. Nice postcard showing the mill, as well as those three landslide scars on Greylock. Another view of the Berkshire Cotton Manufacturing Company, right in the center of Adams. At the bottom of this postcard, you would have President McKinley's statue. Most of those buildings are no longer there. The only one that's still there is the one right in the very center. One of the smokestacks is still there as well. Now here's a little uh, short video of what it's like inside or, and getting out at, for lunch. Whoops, excuse me, getting out for lunch. So that building is still there. The one on the left is there, the one on the right is not. The one on the left has now been turned into apartments. So I think I'm gonna stop this video and I'll show you the inside at the end of my talk if you wanna watch it. It's quite a bit longer and I'll leave it up to you if you want to watch it. Okay, the Berkshire Cotton Mills were started by two brothers. And this is the home of those two brothers, the Plunkett brothers, WB and CT. Now the building on the right is now the Adams Town Hall. The building on the left has been raised and the post office is in that location. Both these brothers were friends of President McKinley, and he came to visit quite often. This is the mansion where uh, the post office is now located. This one was named Montrath. I believe it's an Irish name of the estate the family had back in Ireland. It was demolished in 1937. Another view of it. And an overhead view of both mansions. And a picture postcard showing the statue of McKinley. When he became president, he actually helped to get some tariffs that protected the Berkshire cotton mills from foreign competition. That statue was erected in 1903. As we move down the main street or Park Street in Adams, we come across the Congregational Church and the Parsonage. Almost across the street, is the Adams Town Hall. It had a fire and when it was rebuilt, that castle looking turret was not reconstructed. And now that building is at housing the Northern Berkshire Registry of Deeds and the town police department. Another look up Park Street as we leave this section of town. Notice the trolley tracks running right down the center of town. We took a little side trip up to Summer Street. We heard that there were some beautiful homes there and they certainly are. And we met a trolley there as well. Again, another horse and buggy on the street. Back down and ready to turn now onto Commercial Street, we have the Brown Paper Company. Another view of it as we're entering Commercial Street, it actually took water from the Hoosick, uh, Hoosick River. It, it made linen ledger paper, very, um, very popular with 
town clerks and, and other um, offices that needed to have uh, important papers. This is Brown's home. It was demolished eventually after he died. It became in disrepair. It was bought by uh, C.T. Plunkett. He gave it to the town. And the elementary school was built on this site. Okay, just past that elementary school, we're looking south towards Cheshire, where we're headed. And we can see a beautiful postcard showing what that street looked like. I love the three modes of transportation here, which in 1914 were all very popular. We still had horse and buggy. The trolley was something new. And of course, automobiles were becoming more popular. We have to cross over this bridge as we enter the Maple Grove section of Adams. This bridge is one that was built in 1830 when they reconstructed the road from Cheshire to Adams. And here's a view of Maple Grove. We've just gone over that bridge. Another bridge in Maple Grove section, crossing over the Hoosick River, as well as the railroad tracks. And now we're entering Cheshire. This postcard shows the bridge we're about to go over. It's labeled in the Berkshire Hills Adams Mass, but it's actually in a section of Cheshire known as Cheshire Harbor. And we had heard about that section of town, and we're gonna do some exploring before we move on. We walk down into this part of the harbor where the railroad tracks cross over the Hoosick River. I did a presentation, by the way, about that trolley bridge that we see in the background. And so you'll find it in this, on this same site. We were standing here looking at the tracks and, and enjoying the view of the river. This postcard's from 1905 also, I believe, and you'll notice they had to write on the front. And then while we were there, a train came along. It's a beautiful view of the harbor. You'll notice somebody in a canoe fishing. The reason it's called Cheshire Harbor is because of this quiet spot on the river where you can fish or swim. It is not named for the Underground Railroad. It is named for this quiet location in the river. Okay, we leave Cheshire Harbor and we come up Eastview Drive. Trolley tracks are also on this road. As we enter Cheshire, one of the first things we notice from this postcard is a beautiful old villa known as the Greylock Villa. I did another presentation on historic homes of Cheshire and that is one of the homes that I feature. Okay, a little ways down the road, we come to the cozy camps and we went up on top where those cottages are and we had this beautiful view of Cheshire. Now the mountain we see there is labeled as Mount Hope and I've never heard it called that before, but this postcard labeled it as such. It has the cobbles on it and it's a very popular hiking spot. And the Appalachian Trail also goes over that mountain. Now to show you where these postcards come from, here's the photograph that was used to make that postcard. Same view just colored in. In this picture, we can see the Richmond Iron Company right in the center of the photograph. And the cobbles show up a little better up on top of that mountain. We pass this house on our way into Cheshire. This is a bed and breakfast, which today is the funeral parlor in Cheshire. 
Cheshire had a number of these bed and breakfasts. This particular one uh, was, uh, was, was very popular back at the turn of the 20th century. Just past that home, looking back north, the North Street Cemetery would be just out of view on our left. Okay, we get into Cheshire and this postcard shows a view of Church Street. Trolley tracks running down the right side of the road. Right next to us is Dean's store. Very popular store in town, later bought by the Reynolds family and run as the Reynolds hardware store for many, many years. Dean's home was right next to the store. And of course the town hall is right there as well. This shows the kind of the back of the town hall and that open door is where the first fire station was. And to the right, the brick building to the right, now known as the annex, was the ticket office for the trolley companies. And you can see a trolley is parked there. Postcard of the Universalist Church, later turned into a private home. And a view down Depot Street with its beautiful trees along both sides of the road. Way at the end of this street, you would see the railroad station. Another view of Depot Street. This one looking back towards the town hall. Main Street, which is now known as Church Street. On the left is the original St. Mary's Church. Now the post office is located there. Oops. And finally, as we turn around and look in the other direction, we're looking east into Scrabbletown. And there's a bridge right here that goes over the Hoosick River. That part of town had many homes that immigrants had lived, were living in, as well as uh, workers for the Richmond Iron Company. And it got the name Scrabbletown. And here's a postcard showing the Richmond Iron Company. No longer there. However, there is a street right where it was located known as Furnace Hill. Okay, we're heading out of Cheshire. And as we go down south, we first thing we pass is this old Cheshire Inn. This was originally a home and later turned into an inn. This home is also featured in my talk about historic homes of Cheshire. As we look back up towards Cheshire uh, Corners, that inn is on the left and we can see the Baptist church steeple up there on the right. Now this postcards have a blue saucer. And the reason it's there is because the next thing we see on our way out of town is the blue saucer restaurant. Right there where the boat launch is at the, Hoosier, at the Cheshire Reservoir. And just a little ways down, we come to the Farnham's Lime Company, started by the Farnham brothers after they returned from the Civil War. And this whole section of Cheshire is known as Farnham's. Here's a beautiful view of the reservoir. Now this reservoir was dammed back in the 1860s 
because Brown's Paper Company in Adams needed a more reliable source of water, especially during the dry summer months. As we get closer to Pittsfield, we come to this place known as Berkshire Park. And the cement factory, it, Patrika Cement Factory is in this location now. But at one time it was a beautiful park. Trolleys from the north and the south would bring people to this location, Berkshire Park. Okay, into Pittsfield. This postcard is of the square, the, the center of Pittsfield. Another postcard showing some rather unusual things happening in Pittsfield on North Street. Pretty whimsical, actually. They were redoing the trolley lines when we came through. A postcard of Union Depot, the train station, demolished during urban renewal in the 60s. The inside of it was beautiful. And the original Pittsfield train station. Okay, down into Lenox. We're almost at our destination. The first thing we passed, we had to show you this postcard of Aspinwall. Aspinwall was built in 1902, cost about $400,000, had five floors, had firewalls throughout the building, was one of the first buildings in America to have a fire suppression sprinkler system. It was due to open in June after major renovations. And then it burnt to the ground. It was not occupied at the time. Some painting was going on inside. And the actual cause of the fire was never really determined. Whether someone was in there at night and, and dropped a cigarette or whether something happened um, while the painters were there and then it smoldered and started up, but it was completely destroyed. The fire was in 1931. It had been bought and was in the process of remodeling. Okay, we've reached the end of our drive. I came to visit my friend, the Sloans in Lenox, Mass. This is their home. And here's another view of it. He named it Winhurst. But today, it has a different name. And I'm going to let you try to look it up. But I will tell you that it was a Jesuit school at one time in the 70s. And it was known as Cranwell. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this talk. And if you want to watch the inside of the Berkshire Cotton Manufacturing Company, here's an old movie that you can watch.
Okay, I hope you enjoyed that. And thank you for watching.